Darcy Bustle and I'm president of the Royal Academy of Dance and we're here at the wonderful Victoria and Albert Museum in London and I'm very excited to present a virtual tour of this display on point celebrating a hundred years of the Royal Academy of Dance. So wherever you are in the world you'll get to enjoy this fascinating history of this world-class ballet teaching training organization and see some fascinating cultural artifacts of the ballet world all come together for the very first time in this display. And all the hard work goes down to Jane Pritchard and Eleanor Fitzpatrick, who you'll be meeting later. I'm delighted to be here today to share with you some of the highlights from our display to mark the centenary of the Royal Academy of Dance. In this display, you will see a range of original costumes, designs, artifacts and documents, as well as many photographic images that tell the story of the RAD, its community and its role in the wider ballet world. The display occupies three rooms in the Theatre and Performance Galleries and the arrangement is largely chronological. So in this first room, we learn about the founders of the RAD and the context in which the organisation came into being. The Royal Academy of Dance was founded in 1920 as the Association of Teachers of Operatic Dancing of Great Britain and its purpose was to raise the standard of dance teaching in the UK. A key figure in the founding of the organisation was the editor of the Dancing Times magazine, Philip Richardson, who organised a series of meetings known as the Dancers' Circle Dinners, to which he invited many of the best known and most influential dancers and teachers to get to know one another and discuss the issues surrounding their art. Richardson identified five eminent dance professionals, the international best of the best, who represented the principal schools of ballet training, French, Italian and Russian, and who agreed to form a committee to lead the reformation of dance teaching. Their first task was to devise a syllabus that would provide the foundation for a new British standard. And once agreed, this was presented to a packed meeting of dancers and teachers at the Grafton Galleries in Regent Street on December the 31st, 1920, at which the association was officially established. So at the beginning of the 20th century, there was considerable change in the whole dance scene in Britain. There was a shift from uh, the most popular entertainment, so basically dance had been performed in music halls um, and choreographers such as Espinosa have been heavily involved in that. Uh, essentially, there is a, a radical change. It's, what is happening is that Russian dancers in particular are coming to London. So this is Anna Pavlova, who first of all performs at the Palace Theatre, uh, and Diaghilev's company uh, in 1911. So there is a shift going on, and at the same time, there is a real concern what is happening to training in this country. One of the key people in terms of that was Edward Espinosa, uh, and he wrote a number of books. He got to know Philip Richardson, who he met at the ball that we see in the picture behind us, and they discussed the need to improve the situation. The First World War intervened, and that created a delay, but not a lack of interest. But I think one of the things that's quite fun in the dancing times, Philip Richardson was enabling people to think about the training of dance by a number of the spreads he did. There were a whole range of teachers. Many of them had come out of the old system, so they are ex-music hall performers uh, and ballet mistresses teachers. So Lucia Camani, for example, who will be the Italian representative uh, in respect of the RAD, comes from that background. So there is a real heritage there. And of course, Adelaine Genet and uh, Phyllis Bedells were performers in music hall ballets. So that is part of the British heritage. At the same time, we have this rise of the Russians, and importantly, Astafieva, Serafine Astafieva, opens a school in Chelsea in 1915. So that becomes the first real Russian teacher in Britain. 
And alongside her, there is Enrico Cicchetti, who's working with both Pavlova's company and indeed the Ballet Russe. So he is really training the professional dancers. These are costumes of the three founding ballerinas of the Royal Academy of Dance, and you'll hear a lot more about them later. But first, this is Tamara Kasavana's costume, and it's a French military style, and it would have been a solo where she would have marched around the stage holding a silver trumpet and being very proud and strong, a beautiful blue tunic. The second one is Adeline Genet's costume. It was a production from the Dryads, which is a Greek mythology. And you notice on her dress the oak leaves that would identify her character because she was a Dryad, which is a nymph of the oak tree, which is really charming. And the last one is Phyllis Bedell's, which is a Victorian costume, and she would have played a young dancer in a production of The Deputants, where she joins the opera ballet company and wins the role of the ballerina. I'm standing next to the shoes of Adeline Jenny, the founder ballerina of the Royal Academy of Dance. Now, she was a Danish ballerina, and she was trained by her uncle, Alexander Jenny, and she was the first president of the Royal Academy of Dance. She was a star ballerina at the Empire Theatre in London for 10 years, from 1897, and was the first ballerina to perform a solo for King Edward VII and Queen Alexandra. Soon after that, she helped the success of receiving a royal charter in 1935 for the Royal Academy of Dance. She was keen to promote young British ballet talent, and the Adeline Genet Gold Medal Award was introduced in 1931, and it will always be called the Genet Gold Medal in honour of everything that she did for the Royal Academy of Dance. Tamara Kasavna was the Russian representative on the founders of the Royal Academy of Dance. She had trained in the Imperial Ballet School with a whole range of teachers, and she was going to bring that experience to Britain. She was best known, really, as a ballerina with Serge Diaghilev's company. She was always, I would say, a guest artist. She was never a full-time member of Diaghilev's company, because in those pre-war years, she would return to the Imperial Ballet where she would dance the classics. So she had a dual role. After the war, she moved to Britain. She had married an Englishman, uh, and she again danced with Diaghilev's company, but again as a guest, and had a parallel career with her own pickup group of dancers. And I think this is quite interesting. She returns to Britain in 1918, 1919 she's with Diaghilev, and by 1920 she really has this wide-ranging uh, sort of freelance career. I think what's interesting is that she joins the foundation of the Royal Academy essentially at the moment when her career is really changing. She wasn't someone who had been a teacher, but she was fascinated by teaching. And I think one of the important things is that she will actually bring that heritage from the Imperial Russian Ballet to Britain, and particularly through establishing her own syllabus for the RAD, which really drew on that heritage. In this display, we've really chosen to use material that illustrates her independent career, the area that's least well known. And I think it's particularly important that we're showing four of the designs by Claude Lovett Fraser, his very last work that he was doing for Kasavna. These are wonderfully lively designs, and given that he died a century ago, it's appropriate that they are seen. Interestingly, they came to us relatively recently from a teacher with the Royal Academy of Dance who had taken over responsibility for the Kasavna syllabus. And I think that although Kasavna was somebody who had not grown up in the world of teaching, she discovered a real new interest. With dancers, when they leave the stage, their careers don't end. And when they are teachers, they have wonderful experience to bring to their pupils. Phyllis Bedells was the youngest of the founders and regarded as the 20th century's first British ballerina. Initially, she followed in the footsteps of Adeline Genet, being engaged by the Empire Theatre in 1907, 
but also benefited by experiencing classes with some of the international teachers that had settled in London at this time, developing her own versatile British style. Her talent was recognised by Anna Pavlova, who invited Bedells to join her classes at Ivy House, and her successful partnership with Anton Dolan in the late 1920s showed the strengthening popularity of English dancers at the time. Bedells retired from performing in 1935, and the poster from her farewell matinee displays an impressive lineup of dancers and companies all keen to pay tribute to her. After retiring from the stage, Bedells devoted herself to teaching and remained committed to the work of the RAD for the rest of her life. The Phyllis Bedells Bursary was introduced in 1979 in her honour and is awarded annually to further a young dancer's training. In this space, we explore the heart of the Academy's work in teacher training and syllabus development more fully. And chronologically, it follows the successful petition for a royal charter in 1935, which bolstered Adeline Genet's desire to see ballet recognised as an educational subject. A children's syllabus and examinations were introduced as early as 1924, and the success of these classes fueled the demand for professional dance teachers. Genet enlisted the help of education experts, and in 1939, the first three-year teacher's training course was proposed, launching successfully following the end of the Second World War in 1945. This comprehensive programme was designed to enable graduates to teach in schools of general education and give them the skills required to teach RAD syllabi for exams. In tandem with the development of the teacher training course, a revised children's syllabus known as the Ballet in Education Syllabus was launched in 1946 designed to provide links between ballet and educational subjects such as geography, history and drama through the inclusion of national and historical dances as well as elements of mime. The correct pronunciation of the French terms used for ballet steps and exercises was encouraged through the publication of a record in collaboration with Linguaphone in 1950. In 1956, Schweppes sponsored the production of instructional film strips which provided teachers with a visual reference for basic principles of ballet technique, as well as steps and exercises from the Ballet in Education syllabus. The RAD also continued to provide performance opportunities and maintain links with the professional world. The RAD Production Club, which started in 1932, encouraged choreographic talent and the opportunity for students to gain experience in all aspects of production, including design, music, lighting and makeup. Classes were given by the likes of Anton Dolan, Stanislav Idzikowski, Frederick Ashton and Ninette de Valois, and regular activities included performances, lectures, dance recitals and courses in production skills. Robert Heltman and John Cranko were two of the aspiring choreographers who created works for the club, and in a letter addressed to the production club secretary in 1947, Cranko acknowledges the benefit the production club provided in launching his own career. His ballet, Morceau en Fontaine, was taken into the repertory of Sadler's Wells Theatre Ballet and presented as Children's Corner in 1948. In 1942, Stanislav Vidzikovsky donated this beautiful Harlequin figure, designed by Alfred Gilbert, which became the club's logo and a symbol of its link with the dance profession. It was to be awarded annually for the best production. In 1954, it was time for a change at the Royal Academy of Dance, and the decision was that Margot Fontaine would be the new president. She talks about it in a wonderful way in her autobiography. She was called into the office of Ninette de Valois, who was, of course, her boss, the director of the Royal Ballet, but also a vice president of the RAD. And she sat Fontaine down and said, it's been decided you're going to be the next president of the RAD. No one asked her, it was an instruction. Initially, Fontaine was very nervous, um, but de Valois said, don't worry, you'll just have to turn up for a couple of events a year. What happened was that Margot Fontaine found she was so fascinated by the range of work that the Royal Academy of Dance did that she was taking a very active part very quickly and became a long-serving president right up to the time of her death. One of the things she did was create a series of annual matinees that would fundraise for the RAD. 
What was very important about these was that she invited dancers from all over the world to take part. These actually became a very important part for a decade of the Dance Goers Year. So each year there would be a matinee, including an element of student performance and then great stars. Amongst the artists that she invited to perform was one Rudolf Nureyev, who had just left the Soviet Union. So he was seen at one of these galas for his first performances in Britain. He actually wanted to dance with Fontaine, but she had already arranged that she would be doing her performance with John Gilpin. So their partnership, if you like, was postponed. However, he was a great supporter of her activities for the RAD and staged a number of new works for them. And this is again bringing in the Russian classical tradition into British dance. So the staging of Pekita, for which we have the design on display, the mounting of Raimonda, initially for the Australian Ballet, which was used as the final in the run of galas, were very important events. I'm standing next to a beautiful costume of Margot Fontaine's and I was very fortunate at the age of 20 to be coached by Margot herself. I was doing my first Swan Lake and she came into the studio and it was an extraordinary experience to have her coach me. This costume evokes the romantic era. It's a soft costume from a ballet called Les Salfides and as you can see the length and the, the weight of the net would have made her look like a spirit of the air. Fontaine's contribution as president of the RAD was not limited to her links with the professional world. She was also actively involved and interested in the heart of the Academy's teacher training and syllabus work. One of the highlights in this space is some previously unseen footage of Fontaine presenting the revised children's syllabus in 1972. This short clip shows how involved Fontaine was with the whole process and provides a rare glimpse into her work behind the scenes of the ballet world and her role in helping the RAD to inspire the world to dance. The complete syllabus is divided into five grades, each representing one year's study based on one lesson a week. The first part of this demonstration shows primary grade. It is intended for examination between the ages of six and eight years. In the display, we have a ballet bar to give you that experience of what it's like to be in a studio. And of course, there's footage also of the Royal Academy's syllabus so that you can have a little go at some of the movements that you would do at the bar. What I loved about my training as a dancer is its discipline and structure because it gave you the confidence to have that freedom of expression, which I so loved. In this third space, the focus is on the current and future RAD, where after a hundred years of development, we are now a truly global presence. The work of the RAD initially extended to Commonwealth countries, with members teaching in South Africa as early as 1922, and the first examinations were held there in 1927. In the 1930s, RAD activities extended to Australia and New Zealand, with Canada following in the 1940s. There was rapid expansion in continental Europe during the 50s and 60s, and now the RAD has offices in 36 countries, from Germany to Brazil and from Japan to the United Arab Emirates. Following the death of Margot Fontaine, who remained as president throughout her life, uh, the position was taken up by Antoinette Sibley, so another great ballerina from the Royal Ballet. And I think it's fascinating that all the presidents of the Royal Academy of Dance have actually been dames. So thinking back to quite a long time ago when a group of dames were put together for a photograph in the, uh, a Sunday magazine, one of them, Dame Sybil Thorndike, the actress, said, there must be a collective word for dames. What is it? And she came up with a dazzle of dames. So I like to think of a, the Royal Academy of Dance having had a dazzle of dames to lead it. But Sibley uh, was, like her predecessors, like her successor, somebody who was concerned in keeping the Royal Academy of Dance up to date and taking a very active role. She was very present doing workshops, coaching um, and really serving as a full-term president. Through the display, one of the things that we did want to do was to include costumes that really gave people a sense of an idea of, of ballet. I think that was very important for a general visitor, uh, but also to include costumes to represent each 
of those presidents. So for Antoinette Sibley, we have the costume that she wore for uh, Sleeping Beauty, so as Aurora. We've also got the design for that costume by Leela De Nobili. We have photograph of uh, Sibley performing it. Uh, and we also in this section include footage of three of our presidents uh, actually in performance in costumes as shown. So bringing those costumes to life. I stepped into the shoes of Dame Antoinette Sibley when she retired as president of the Royal Academy of Dance. And I'm the fourth president in a hundred years of the Royal Academy of Dance, which is quite extraordinary. I admired Antoinette so much as a young artist when I was growing up, watching her in so many of her roles, especially with her partnership, her dance partnership with Sir Anthony Dowell, and also the wonderful collaboration they had with the great choreographer, Sir Frederick Ashton. And I also was very fortunate to work with a great choreographer, Sir Kenneth Macmillan, in a ballet called Prince of the Pagodas. And this costume here is actually from that ballet. It's my costume. And the role I was playing was Princess Rose. And it's lovely that it's up here with a lot of the other costumes in the display. As we have already heard, in 1931, Adeline Genet proposed the annual award of a gold medal. Held exclusively in London until 2001, the first Genet International Ballet Competition was held in Sydney, Australia in 2002, and since then has been hosted in major cities around the world. Renamed the Margot Fontaine International Ballet Competition from 2020 in honour of our longest serving president, it has become one of the most prestigious ballet competitions in the world, attracting the finest young dancers trained in the RAD syllabus. But it's not just about competing. The experience all candidates receive through the coaching process provides a link between technique and artistry or rehearsal and live performance. Following the death of Queen Mary in 1953, her granddaughter Elizabeth II agreed to succeed her as the Academy's royal patron. To mark this, Adeline Genet presented the Academy with a silver plaque, the Queen Elizabeth II Coronation Award, to be presented annually in recognition of outstanding services to the art of ballet. The first recipient in 1954 was Dame Nanette de Valois, founder of the Royal Ballet, and since then the award has been given to many of the most famous names in ballet, including Sir Frederick Ashton, Rudolf Nureyev, Dame Gillian Lynn, Sir Peter Wright and Carlos Acosta. We've come to the end of our virtual tour of On Point, and I want to thank the VNA for hosting 100 years of the Royal Academy of Dance and its impact on ballet. And also thank the curators, Jane and Eleanor, for their wonderful work and to everyone else that made it possible.